Okay, uh, we'll start our discussion about change detection, quickest change detection. which is basically the log likelihood test that we are trying to study. And we have done that for Markov chains over discrete state spaces. And now the goal would be to do it for Markov chains over continuous state spaces or Markov processes. So we have this process Okay, and xt is the state, this is the action, and this is the noise. And of course, we have some policy, ut equals to some gamma of xt, which is the policy control policy. <coughs> so I have a state and the policy takes as input the state and figures out what the action should be. Okay. So just like we talked about the transition matrix in the context of finite MDPs, we can talk about the transition kernel, it's called a kernel, in the context of uh, continuous MDP. So here, xt is no longer uh, finite, xt is, xt lies in Rn. So it's some real number, no longer a finite set. So remember in the previous discussion, we had mentioned that many a times it makes sense that you have some real number like temperature and you discretize it and you consider 69, 70, 71, 72 and so on. So you've discretized the state in that situation. Uh, in some cases the state is automatically discrete. For instance, the queuing problem that you are currently solving, uh, working on in assignment one, there the state is the number of packets which by definition is discrete. Now. There are many situations where, where it may not make sense to discretize the state because you may come up with very large number of discretization points. So for instance, when you have one temperature sensor, yes, you can discretize it. Now when you have 50 temperature sensors, which is the case in this building, and let's say the temperature ranges between 70 to 75, uh, let me make it a closed interval then the discretization would be 70, 71, 72, 72. This is before discretization. This is after discretization. This is a vector in 50 dimensions, but if you discretize it, now you have how many points? One, two, three, four, five, six. So you have six raised to 50 number of states. <coughs> okay, so we have 50 rooms in this particular building and each room has a thermostat. So I have a total of 50 dimensional temperature reading. <clears throat> but if you wanted to discretize, let's say you wanted to use the finite MDP setting, which is what we studied in the previous lecture, then you will have the state space, which is of the size of six raised to 50, which is a humongous state space. You probably won't be even, even able to store it in the, in the memory, the number of states, okay? So it becomes very difficult to manage a situation of this type. So it's better that you let it remain the real number raised to 50, in which case it's just a, it's just a vector. 
Okay, you don't have to store it. So as we will study in this particular setting, we don't actually have to store the number of states in, in our memory. So in your assignment, you will notice that you have to store the entire probability transition matrix in your memory, right? Um, and the probability transition matrix in that case, in the case of your assignment, is actually uh, four cross four in most situations, four cross four or five cross five. So it's not that, that much, like you can store a lot of such matrices in your memory. But when your number of states become six raised to 50, you will have a matrix with six raised to 50 rows and six raised to 50 columns. It's, it's unmanageable to store it. It's impossible. So therefore, we don't want to use this approach. And we want to use, we want to let the state be a, a continuous variable. And we want to understand, OK, how do we detect an attack if that is what my state looks like? And that's what we are going to study now. Any questions on this? So before this characterization, how, how big is the, what's the difference in size? Uh, so before discretization, it is uncountable. So we'll come up with a different methodology to, which doesn't require us storing a matrix. OK, that's what we will talk about now. Any other question? Also, before you denoted F with a subscript of uh, T. T, right? Which means that F also depends on time. Time, that's right. And now it's not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going to assume that F depends on time. But we can. I mean, if you want, but I can put it there. If it's F of x of T and x of T depends on time. That's okay. The temperature depends on time, but whether the evolution of temperature in this room itself depends on time or not, okay. that, that is. So in my opinion, the temperature, the evolution of temperature in this room, that doesn't depend on time. It depends on the current temperature, which could depend on time, depends on how much cold air was pumped yeah. into this room, okay. right? which is time dependent, and it depends on what the outside weather temperature is, or how many people are inside the room, which is W of T. And that does not mean that the function itself is Correct. Of time. Yeah, function is independent function of time. Is not changing. That's right, function is not changing. Um, if you have a motor, and this is, let's say, the voltage, this is the current through the motor, this is some loading on the motor. Uh, I mean, I'm hoping that that motor is not really changing its properties over time. Okay. Now, when would F depend on time? Uh, so, one situation where F depends on time is say an aircraft moving, going from say US to Europe. So it's going to shed, let's say, uh, like it may have like 20% of the mass of the aircraft would be fuel. And by the time it's landing in Europe, the fuel is all spent. And that 20% of the mass is off the aircraft. So in that case, the, you can do two things. One is you consider the mass as a state, and then you don't have to worry about it. Or you consider mass as, as property of this f, where now f depends a function of time. F, be f becomes a function of time. That happens also in rockets, OK? Uh, that happens on vehicles as well. But the, the thing with vehicles is once, so typically in my vehicle, it's, it'll be me traveling, right? But sometimes my wife will be traveling. Sometimes my wife and kids will be traveling. So the weight of the vehicle will change. But it just changes for the entire duration of the trip. Like, it remains static for the entire duration of the trip, but it doesn't really change during the trip. Um, I mean, the weight of the fuel is very small in comparison to the weight of the vehicle. So in those cases, F remains static. It doesn't really depend on time. Another case where F depends on time is if the temperature of the system is rising or dropping. So if I am. Uh, traveling from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, then my car will undergo a temperature change of, let's say, 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. When I'm at the bottom, the temperature would be 100 Fahrenheit. When I'm at the top, the temperature would be 50 Fahrenheit or 40 Fahrenheit. So there's a huge temperature gradation, in which case, again, assuming some parameters depend on temperature, then F would become a function of time. Or you could alternatively assume that the temperature is a state of the system, but then you have to measure it, right? So if you think something is a state, then you have to measure it. How will you measure the mass of a flying aircraft? It's not easy, right? So 
So there are some situations where it may make sense. Uh, in some situations, f may not be a function of time. So I'll just uh, leave you to think what would happen if f is a function of time or not. Let me, for the sake of generality, because he asked me, I'm just going to let this be a function of time. OK. All right. Now, we are talking about continuous state space. So we need to figure out how to denote the transition kernel. So now the transition kernel is a bit more complicated. So here is how we would denote the transition kernel. What's the probability that xt plus 1 is in some set A given small xt and small ut? Now this becomes the transition kernel. So now you have to figure out A is a subset of R n, the same R n. So this is known as the transition kernel. OK. Now, let me write down what the expression is going to look like. And then I'm going to make an assumption that there is a density. So this expression is the same as probability that f of t, xt, ut, wt is in A given xt, ut. OK. Now, uh, how do we compute this particular probability? So well, xt and ut is given. So these two values are given. wt is the only random variable in this particular expression, because xt and ut are already given. Then I can write it as integral or probability of wt in ft of xt ut dot inverse a. OK, so I can invert the function. And I can figure out what's the probability of this event. Now this is, again, a very complicated expression. It's not easy to evaluate. So I'm just going to make an assumption here that this is uh, well, GT of wt and this is ft inverse a dwt so i'm going to assume that my noise has some pdf probability density function okay so i'm uh, not assuming that noise has some general distribution it must have a density function so if it has a density function then i can write that particular expression as this complicated looking expression. All in all, I'm going to denote, let me call it g tilde t, because I'm going to use gt for something else. So I'm going to denote xt plus 1 in A given xt comma ut is equal to integral So this is my conditional PDF.
Okay, that's my conditional PDF. And these two expressions are equal. This expression is equal to this expression. It's just that I'm doing a change of variables here. Okay, so here this variable was WT. Now I'm changing the variable to XT plus one. And this is the way I'm denoting that whole complicated expression because this is much simpler. And then DXT plus one. Okay, now I'll give you an example because uh, I think the example is far more illustrative of what GT would look like. So I'll give you an example so that we understand what I'm trying to do here. So any questions so far? All I'm making an assumption is this conditional probability should have a PDF, a conditional PDF. Okay, that's all I'm trying to say here. Uh, but I wanted to show you how to derive that expression, how to make, where exactly are we making this assumption of PDF. So let's assume that my WT is Gaussian and this is linear in WT, FT is linear in WT. So that's the assumption I'm going to make. This is fairly common assumption. So it's a common assumption, so therefore, don't get alarmed by thinking that this is a special case because this case would be satisfied in a very large number of settings. So the assumption is my xt plus one equals to ft xt ut plus wt and my wt is Gaussian with mean zero noise sigma w sorry, covariance sigma w, and I'm going to use uh, g tilde t is the PDF. Everyone remembers what the PDF of the Gaussian, zero mean Gaussian random ve vector is? It was given in one of the previous classes. Uh, one over square root of two pi determinant of sigma w, blah, blah, blah. There's a long expression. Okay, so what's the probability of xt plus one in A given xt ut? That is probability of wt in a minus given x t u t. <clears throat> I'll let you think about it for a little bit. Okay, so I'm subtracting from this set A, I'm subtracting this particular vector. This is a unique vector because this is evaluated at xt and ut, which is given the function ft evaluated at xt and ut. This part is given. I'm subtracting from this set A exactly that quantity, that vector. And I want to know what's the probability that wt will be in this particular set. And that's exactly this particular expression. So this would be integral of g tilde t uh, xt plus one minus ft xt ut dxt plus one, where g tilde t is the PDF that was used here. And this is integral over A.
okay Okay, so by through a change of variable, I can write this particular probability exactly in this format, where g tilde t is the PDF of noise wt, and xt plus one is the state at the next time step, which is a random variable, and we want to know what's the probability that xt plus one will be in the set A, and the mean of xt plus one. So remember, wt is a zero mean, zero mean random variable. So the expected value of xt plus one, which is the average value of xt plus one, is just this particular function, because wt will average out to be zero. So you subtract the mean from xt plus one, that gives you exactly w of t. So this is my w of t, and then uh, the dxt plus one is the same as dwt plus one. Oh, sorry, dwt because uh, this term is a constant. The reason why this is a constant is because this is given as part of the transition kernel. Okay, so it's a bit of uh, uh, like, uh, what, what is it called? Transformations that you do in probability, transformation of random variables that you do in probability. Uh, and I'm assuming that you might have seen it before and I'm just recalling it uh, so that you remember where we get this expression from. And now this is the expression g tilde of t xt minus blah, blah, blah. I'm going to replace it with gt of xt plus one given xt ut. And let me write it here. Where should I write it? Maybe I should write it. Maybe I should write it here. Well, so this term, This term is gt plus gt of xt plus one given xt ut. This whole term that you see in the box. Okay, so under common, under certain common assumptions, um, this is what my uh, state evolution equation would look like, where the WT, the actuation noise, is typically considered to be a Gaussian variable. You can replace the Gaussian, at least uh, this particular distribution, with any other distribution which has a PDF. None of this analysis is going to change. So it could be bi-exponential, it could be Gaussian, it could be some other viable distribution. As long as it has a PDF, you are in good shape. If it doesn't have a PDF, we cannot apply the theory that I'm going to talk about today. So we'll assume the PDF. We'll assume that the noise has certain PDF, probability density function, and we know what that probability density function is. It could be bi-exponential, it could be Gaussian, it could be some other form of PDF. Under all the conditions, as long as it has a PDF, I can go through this particular analysis and I can get the value of gt of xt plus one given xt ut. Now, of course, in, in general, you don't really observe the noise, but what you do observe is uh, the state xt plus one, which is the next state, and then xt and ut. So what I observe is what my th thermostat temperature right now is, what my thermostat temperature 30 minutes later is, and how much cold air was injected into this room. So we have the data for all of those different parameters. So UT is how much air was, the volume of cold air injected into the room. XT is the current temperature, XT plus one is the temperature after 30 minutes. But what the system, the, the building management system here does not know is how many people are inside the room, right, because that's there is no sensor to measure how many people have come inside the room. And there is not, no way to measure how much thermal leakage is happening from different, different parts of the building. So uh, if, well, this is a basement, so I don't think there is, uh, it's directly exposed to the outside weather. 
but perhaps from the ground there is some amount of thermal leakage happening there is some amount of thermal leakage happening from the two rooms on this these two sides and there may be some amount of air seeping through the door like under the door so there is no way to measure all those noise terms so wt is kind of unknown it's it's not visible to us okay so everyone understands how this gt is derived so okay in that case, No, all I'm saying is, you know, you know, you know the distribution of WT, which you can find out using data. So you have the, dis you know, XT plus one, you know, XT and you know, UT, you have the data for the last one year. You can push it through a histogram uh, creator and it will give you what the noise statistics for WT looks like. It's most likely going to be Gaussian. I have done that for my home and it's a Gaussian distribution for my house. I'm assuming that that would be the case for this place as well. Could you explain this part again, like this, it was not clear? Uh, what part is not clear? How to go from this model to this yes. transition function? So this is your model. I'm assuming that you have a PDF for WT and that PDF is known, okay? And then I went through this particular derivation and all I'm saying is this, this conditional probability is equal to g tilde of t xt plus 1 minus blah, 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 dxt plus 1. And I'm going to rename this particular box. I'm going to rename it as gt of xt plus 1 given xt ut. This part, like, uh, how, how, how do I go from here to here? That expression was written here. So let me write it again, okay? Wt is in A minus given xt ut integral A minus ft xt ut g tilde t wt dwt right this was written here on this side of the board. And now I'm going to do a change of variables. So I'm going to call xt plus one equals to. F inverse t of a. Right, so now I have a very specific ft that I'm using, right? So that's the inverse function. Okay. This is the inverse function in that, in this situation. Okay. And so now I'm just going to do a change of variables. So I'm going to define xt plus one or wt. I'm going to do a change of variables wt equals to xt plus one minus ft xt ut, right? I can do the change of variable and then I will have to make the appropriate modification to the set, appropriate modification here and appropriate modification here and I get this particular expression, okay? So this was the missing link that I did not write because I didn't have the space there. But hope now it's clear how the transformation happens. <clears throat> okay? Any other question? No question? Okay. Let me erase this part. Now I have to set up a hypothesis test and I'm going to follow basically the same line of thought as we did in the previous lecture for the finite state space setting. So anyone remembers what the hypothesis test for the finite state space was? Maybe you can go back to your notes and try to remind me what was the hypothesis test we had set up. Evolution test 
Sorry? Remember, we had set up a hypothesis test for detecting attacks on a, on a discrete state Markov chain. The hypothesis was uh, that the uh, sequence that's of T was coming from the pre-attack transfer. That's right. Correct. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Exactly. So the hypothesis test was, so we were making the following assumption in, in the previous case. The first assumption was we know exactly what's going to happen post-attack. So I know the transition kernel of post-attack. So the setting here is the same. I have a GT1 or GT, uh, how should I write no attack? Zero. GT0, this is the conditional PDF pre-attack GT1, this is the conditional PDF post-attack and this is known. So your supervisor told you that here are the list of five attacks that I expect to see on this particular system. And under those attacks, you went back to the drawing board, you went back to your, your notes, and you saw, saw, okay, what's going to happen under this attack? You did the modeling, and then you figured out, okay, before the attack, GT0 is going to be the, the transition kernel for this particular, or transition cumulative PDF, sorry, conditional PDF uh, in the pre-attack situation, but post-attack, if the attack happens during the process, it's the transition kernel is going to change to this particular, the, cumulate, the conditional PDF is going to change to GT1. And now the question is, how do we detect? So here is the hypothesis test, H0, X1 to XT is, uh, forms a, has transition kernel GT0 and HA alternate hypothesis is X nu XT has transition kernel GT1. So this is a persistent attacker. The attacker starts at time nu and persistently attacks the system all the way to time capital T. And it has a transition kernel of GT1. Thankfully, there is a QSUM scheme for this particular class of attacks as well. Not very different from what we saw for the Markov chain, which is SK to N equals to T equals to K to N minus one log of G T of XT plus one given X T U T over G G T one G T zero X T plus one given X T U T. G T one goes on the top, G T zero goes on the bottom. And then you define the stopping rule n as n in, in infimum or minimum or infimum, yeah, infimum is good, infimum such that max over 0 less than k less than equal to n, n s k n is greater than equal to c.
so if there is no attack with exceedingly high probability this event will never occur and so you will never raise an alarm but if this happens if your max of this summation of log likelihood becomes exceeds the threshold c then you raise an alarm and you can always change this u of t with gamma t of xt okay so if you already have a specific control policy you can use that control policy there okay so as you can see now the so in the previous case for finite markov chain the problem was you need to compute the transition kernel okay the transition matrix was supposed to be known and you have to store it in the memory and you have to use it from the memory now how we have gotten around that storage thing so now we don't have to store the transition probability matrix all we have to store is the transition uh, conditional pdf so instead of storing the matrix we have to store the pdf now how do you store gaussian pdf just the mean and covariance that's it two vectors one vector and one matrix so storing pdf is of course much simpler than storing a huge matrix right so we have gotten around that difficulty by assuming that there is a pdf and not a matrix in this situation okay so that's the simplification we have made here in order to keep things tractable and as i mentioned for my own house uh the temperature if i look at the noise distribution of my temperature it's actually a gaussian distribution and why is it a gaussian distribution well the problem is there is a lot of leakage in my own house you know my i have a 3 year old daughter she can open the door she can open the window she is pretty capable of doing all of that right so she can do that and when she does it there is a whole gust of cold air that comes in and you have this temperature of my entire house going down pretty rapidly right so it happens and and that's why you see a gaussian distribution so those are extreme events where the temperature goes down significantly even though the heater may be running and that's because my daughter has opened the window or a door um or somebody is coming in and out of the house or we are you know moving groceries from our car to the house in all of those situations either the warm air is coming in or the cold air is coming in and so if you look at the aggregate effect over long periods of time it's pretty nice gaussian distribution uh, gaussian distributed noise so that's why we see gaussian distribution in many situations okay so in this case any question so far it's very similar to what we did for the discrete case okay except that the matrix changed to conditional pdf like second case in discrete so here we have this gt1 is unknown like gt1 is known we have that case like we don't know the gt right so i'll i'll get to it in a bit okay so the question is what happens when this is unknown okay so uh, the problem is for the general case it's uh, I don't know if there is any work that has solved the unknown case or not okay even if it is then it's not really a well known paper and it's probably it requires quite a bit of effort to figure that out so the unknown case is uh, i would say very difficult but what is possible is you have gt of theta theta is unknown theta unknown but capital theta is known so capital theta is the set of all theta so let's consider the following that i don't know what the mean of the attack is 
So let's say GT1, I don't know what the mean of the attack vector would be, but I, what I do know is that the attack vector should be between 0 0.5 and 1. Okay, so that's my capital theta. That's the set of all possible theta that you would see under attack, but you don't quite know which of the theta it is going to be. And so I'm going to change it to theta everywhere. Okay. I, I want you to see where all changes, I mean, where am I making changes? So I made a change here. So my x nu to xt is, has transition kernel gt theta. I'm going to make gt theta in the numerator here, and this skn would become a function of theta. It's no longer independent of theta. Now, here, I'm going to make a major change. greater than or equal to C. So as you can see, there is a supremum over all possible theta that I have to take here. And this is known as generalized log likelihood test. So now my log likelihood function is a function of theta. Now I have to take supremum over all possible theta. Then I have to take maximum for all k between 0 to n. So as you can see, this is a very complicated operation. It's not straightforward. Uh, it's a complicated operation, but you have to do all this operation and see whether it's greater than or equal to c or not. If it is greater than or equal to c, you raise an alarm. If it is less than c, you don't raise an alarm. But the computation is very heavy here. So once again, when you don't know what kind of attack you are going to see, you have to do a far more sophisticated computation, just like it was the case in the earlier situation as well. So what we have done so far is as follows. I have a autonomous system which has a state, which has an action and which is subjected to some noise. And I have a, a state transition function. I know my system very well. I know the statistics of the noise very well. I have some control policy. This policy could come from some optimization algorithm that is being solved, or that policy could come from uh, some inbuilt logic. For instance, in thermostats, there is inbuilt logic. If temperature is above something, turn on the AC. If temperature is below something, uh, turn off the AC, right? So there is some, some in some cases, there'll be inbuilt logic in the microcontroller or PLC, programmable logic controller. In some cases, you are solving an optimization problem to come up with gamma T. Or in some cases, it's just a heuristic that somebody thought, thought up and, and, and just implemented that on the system. So for instance, in your uh, assignment, there is join shortest queue. There's no optimality property of join shortest queue, or it's just somebody cooked it up in, in his or her head, 
and implemented that policy on the system. Okay, so the policy could come from various different ways. Now, we have the system that is running. It's running according to this particular policy and, uh, and, and so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the state and I'm looking at the action that I've implemented on the system. Okay, so, so I have this data, x0, u0, x1, u1, x2, u2, and so on. And I'm looking at this data, I'm computing this uh, log likelihood sum, and I'm checking whether it's above the threshold or below the threshold. And if it is above the threshold, I raise an alarm and then somebody has to come and check if, if things are working okay or if it is a false alarm or if it is actually a true alarm. This is known as a passive detection scheme. Passive means you are letting the system run as it is, you are collecting the data, you are processing the data and raising an alarm if something is going bad or not going bad. This is passive. What we are going to do in the next class, which is going to be on Monday, we are going to talk about active detection schemes, okay? So active attack detection schemes. So in passive, you let the system run normally and you look at the data and process the data. In active, you actually probe the system for more information. And how do you probe the system? So as a building manager or as a facilities manager of this building, how are you going to probe the system to figure out whether an attack is happening or not? That's an active attack detection scheme. So the way you probe the system is you perturb the policy, okay? You perturb the policy in a very randomized, in a very, very controlled randomized fashion. Now, when you, but, but the way you perturb it, only you know, because you are the facilities manager, it's in your head, the perturbation is in your head. It's not in attacker's head. The attacker will never know what's going on inside your head. So what you have done is you have the perturbation in mind and you are perturbing the system. You are, let's say, uh, changing the airflow that's going inside the rooms. So you are increasing the airflow. You're decreasing the airflow and so on. You're actively perturbing the system, but the perturbation is very small. It's not significant. So, I'm, so what the active detection scheme tries to do is it perturbs the control policy or perturbs the control action that you are implementing on the system in order to probe how the system is evolving. If the system is evolving according to what the model suggests, which is this particular model, you are in good shape. But if the system is not behaving the way you are expecting it to behave, then there is a problem in the system. Okay, and that's how you detect that there is an attack happening on the system. So to give you an example, uh, suppose an adversary is replaying uh, the same thermostat data from yesterday, today to the building manager. Now the building manager says, look, the data looks pretty authentic because, well, it's actual temperature data from yesterday, so the building manager, this data looks pretty authentic. But now the building manager says, hey, look, there seems to be something wrong because I see that the trend is the same as yesterday's trend, so let me run some tests. I'm going to increase the airflow into the room and I expect the room to get cooled down, okay? That's what I expect. However, when I do that, I see that actually the room is not showing any evidence of cooling at this point of time because the data is getting replayed from yesterday. So there was no cooling yesterday. Now you know that there's something happening inside the room. There's something, some problem, either with the sensor or some attack is going on or something is going bad inside the room. And that's exactly what active detection scheme tries to do. And that is known as dynamic watermarking. So, you know, if you have like one dollar note, you will, you can put it against the, against the light and you will see some watermarks. Those are known as watermarks. So what we are trying to do is, so in older days, how do you detect whether a note, a $1 note or a $5 note is authentic or not? Well, you look for the watermark, okay? That's how you check whether a note is authentic or not. 
How do you check whether a control system is authentic or not? You add a watermark to the control policy and you try to see whether you see that signature in the output or not. If there is no signature in the output, then it means something is going wrong. If there is signature in the output, then it means everything is going fine. So we'll talk about dynamic watermarking in the next class. And it's going to basically build on some of the stuff that we have done here. So uh, I will talk about it on Monday. Uh, have a great weekend.